So our friend entropy, it's responsible for explaining why sometimes exothermic reactions don't happen under certain conditions, but other times endothermic reactions can happen. Um, the symbol for entropy is delta S. I don't know why, it just is, but you'll notice it's a capital S. So entropy is S, delta H is enthalpy. Okay, they're both capital letters because they're state functions. If you remember back in chapter five, we talked about this. And essentially in chemistry anyway, I know this deviates for engineering and physics, but in chemistry, we have the, the general kind of protocol that a state function will be a capital variable and non-state functions like heat are not. So what I mean by state function is that it's only the beginning and the end that matter, the final and the initial. So the example I usually give in 141 is if, um, if you're standing at the top of the Grand Canyon and you have several different choices on how to get down to the bottom, which variable you think about will determine whether it's a state function or whether it's not. So for example, you can hike down with your own two feet. You can ride a donkey down. You can paraglide down. You can use a helicopter, all kinds of different ways to get down from, from the top to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. If you're thinking about the energy expense that you put into it, clearly walking down with your feet is going to be a high, high expense. Whereas, you know, paragliding for you won't be nearly as much energy expenditure. So that is not a state function. Um, altitude, not a state function. You start at the top, you end up at the bottom. That's not correct. Altitude is a state function is what I meant to say. So you start at the top, you end up at the bottom. You could go up and down several times in between, turn around and go back up the path, go back down, back and forth, back and forth, but it doesn't matter because the only thing that, that matters is the amount of altitude you have um, changed, right? And so that would be a state function. Of course, we all know if we go up and down, up and down, you're spending more energy. That's why energy is not a state function. Okay, so there are two different kinds of ideas. So entropy and enthalpy, it doesn't matter if you have a multiple intermediate situation or if your reaction just goes straight from reactants to products or it goes back and forth, back and forth and then it stays on products. Whatever it is, the only thing that matters is your final state minus your initial state. So it's a state function. Um, so, Remember that Q is heat. And when we write the REV, what we mean is the reverse. Um, so if you can imagine however much heat is consumed or produced by the reverse reaction is what goes in the numerator here. And the bottom is temperature in Kelvin. Um, so usually we have units of joules per Kelvin for entropy because Q is joules and T is Kelvin, okay? Um, so the reverse of, of um, melting ice is fusion, delta H of fusion. We call this the heat of fusion or the enthalpy of fusion. Uh, it's a known value. Just look it up. It comes in many different units. This is the one for joules and moles. You can find it in calories and kilojoules and all kinds of stuff, but this is, this is a good one for us. So in order to figure out the entropy of ice melting, if we have one mole of ice at zero degrees Celsius, it's really just um, unit conversions, right? So one mole of ice. So we're gonna first convert the energy by um, multiplying by how much we have. Of course, that doesn't change the numbers. I'm just getting rid of a unit. And then of course, zero degrees Celsius is the same thing as 273.15 Kelvin. So all we gotta do is plug this in, right? And we find out that the change in entropy, this is the change of, in entropy for ice, for ice is equal to 22 joules per Kelvin. 
okay? So we see a positive change in entropy. That's, that's because I'm going from solid ice to a liquid ice, and we envision solid is more organized and a liquid is more disorganized. So we would expect this to be a positive value. So that's a good sign. It's a good sign, get it? <laughs> so now let's think about this. Uh, if that ice were in the freezer, that process would be different. But here we're talking about at the freezing point, zero degrees Celsius. So if I take the ice and I put it in my hand, all right, which is of course warmer than zero degrees Celsius most days, if I hold that ice, of course it's gonna melt. The question is, why? Okay, well, you know that your hand is gonna get cold. Okay, that's because that 22 joules per Kelvin is being absorbed um, by the hand, right? The two objects in contact, um, kinda, except there's a difference, right? The temperature of the ice is around zero Celsius and the temperature of my hand is not, it's about 37 Celsius. Um, and that makes a pretty darn big difference because of course temperature is in the bottom of your, your entropy calculation. So if my hand were, were like really, really, really close to zero Celsius or even at zero Celsius, if, if you want to think about it that way, then melting is an equilibrium process, right? It's dynamic equilibrium at that point. So the solid and the liquid phases exist together simultaneously. Are you seeing the connection with the combustion question yet? Um, so let, let's just calculate it. Let's calculate it for my hand, right? And so the same amount of heat is going to be transferred. So it's still, oops, it's still that much heat. But instead of 273.15, I'm at 37. That's the normal body temperature. Um, so that's 310. 0.15. And so this will be the delta S of the hand. We end up with 19.4. A pretty dramatic difference, right? 22 versus 19.4. So not all of the entropy that's given off from the ice melting is actually going into my hand. And this is the second law of thermodynamics. Remember, I said that it's the delta S of the whole universe. In this case, my hand is gonna be the surroundings, right? So in, in science and chemistry, especially, it's really easy to define the surroundings. It's everything that's not the reaction, all right? And so the ice is the, is the system. So we have 22 joules per Kelvin from the system. And so we have to remember which one's gaining, which one's losing, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the ice is, is increasing in disorder, so that'll be a positive number. The hand is decreasing in, in disorder. So really the Qs are opposite. So Q of the ice is equal but opposite to the Q of the hand. So really, if we're being really good with our signs, which you should be, it's negative 19.4. So we have plus negative 19.4 joules per K. And so overall in the entire universe, as a result of this process, we end up with an increase of 2.6 joules per Kelvin. And that is why ice melts spontaneously above zero. Okay, it means you have to have a warmer object in contact with it, whether it's air, the countertop, your hand, whatever it is. Um, that is going to have a decrease in entropy, that object, those surroundings, and the ice will have an increase of entropy. And if the difference between them is positive, then it will happen. If it's not positive, it won't happen. Okay, so if this number were below 273, this number ends up negative. So don't fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I calculated a positive delta S of my system, I'm done because that's not true. What is true is if you add the system and surroundings together and it's bigger than zero, that will happen. For a reversible process, as it turns out, so we're talking about equilibrium here, okay? So for reversible processes, the 
delta s of the universe has to be zero. Okay, you should fill in the bottom here. I just told you the answer. 